The Daily News Innovation Lab started last year with a mission to transform media together. Our original concept was to work with startups because we'd seen the power of par partnering traditional media companies with startups and how impactful that could be both for the startup and for the media company. What started to happen was as we started having conversations with people about this program, we realized that there were all kinds of fascinating people interested in the exact same issues we were interested in. Not just media companies, also entrepreneurs, educators, venture. There was a lot happening in New York around this topic. I'm very curious to hear what you guys are seeing on other sites, or if you could just name one thing that you admire about another news publication. And <coughs> Joe, I'm going to you. Because <laughs> you were looking away, so I'm going to you. Um, well, you know, I was, uh, I'm really impressed by what they're doing over at uh, a lot of places, but, you know, Vox.com. And that's something that, you know, I look at that and want to strive for that clarity. That big picture to remember that when something big is going on that I feel like everyone in my industry, finance, understands well, that it's also important to really think about writing these things in plain English that uh, the masses understand well. I was definitely impressed by that. I would look at these two guys, BuzzFeed and Business Insiders, being great examples of publications where it's like something, something happens either in the real world or on the internet and it's instantly there. Um, and that's something that I think that we could be better at. Business Insiders is so fast at getting news up right away okay. and then filling in the information, like getting up the main news and then filling it with more information. And I think that's just a smart way of getting getting news out there. Just getting the, that yeah. first initial yeah. before anyone else yeah. type of thing. Yeah. I will say Circa. I think that what Anthony Gross and the team over there are doing is really interesting. I think that they were pretty ahead of a lot of other news publishers and just trying to slow things down and give you a bit of context and help you kind of find your way to cut through the clutter and understand the key issues and differentiate fact from opinion. Uh, I think that they've done a, a good job. I think that it's a very noble cause. My question for you is if there was one thing that would really distinguish you for the future, like just one thing you had to say that was like your hallmark to fame, what would it be? Video. <laughs> quizzes? <laughs> um, yeah, quizzes. Quizzes? <laughs> uh, I like that we have a business audience. I feel like it helps us a little bit uh, differentiate. Uh, mystique? <laughs> uh, I, w I, was, I was joking earlier with some folks that uh, uh, what is the bird has become like a running joke of a question that uh, people ask us and, and we ask ourselves on an ongoing basis. I think that uh, not necessarily having 100% of that answer actually works for our, our advantage. So my question is more content or sorry oriented. So when digital spiked, everyone thought that a lot of the institutional publications, you know, would either close and obviously there's a huge shift that's taking place in format. But I'm wondering from each of you, as far as content and news goes, if there are still avenues or just uh, if there's more, if there's ways that you'd like to be pushing the envelope or things you'd like to be covering more than you are now, or you know, if there's more gaps that you see to be filled as far as content and what kinds of things are getting covered by the media. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the day that our pitches and the, the kinds of stories that we want to cover outnumber our r reporters is a very sad day indeed. Uh, or, wait, the other way around, excuse me. Um, take that back. Uh, no, it's, it, we, we always are lamenting uh, limited staff, and I think that that's a good place to be. You want to just be bursting at the seams with ideas. Uh, and so the, the short answer to your question for us is, is yes, there's lots of additional uh, stories we could be covering and entire uh, kinds and categories of content that we, we, we could be covering, I think. Sounds good. The first one, I'm going to try and extrapolate. I'm going to pull it in as I'm asking you from, uh, from Robin, uh, our friend at CrowdTangle. Can we, can we talk about startups? I, I think maybe <laughs> one way we could expand on this. So not, not startups maybe as competitors, but for us, it, it's data visual. You know, that's, that's the startup in our incubator. They're doing some great stuff for us and for other people to supplement their coverage. So maybe not competitors so much, but 
are there startups out there that you're working with or they catch your eye they're doing some great things that are uh, are really building on the work that not only your four organizations but others are doing as well startups are great that's who does a startup yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you're if you're not paying attention to the startup landscape, you're you're kind of missing the boat in many ways. Um, we, I mean, that's how we came across editorially, and now we own them. Um, and and we're you know just like everybody else in the New York media scene, we are heavily engaged in Slack. We can't do our jobs without Slack. Just pack up. We packed up and went home yesterday. No, we didn't. Uh, but it was it felt that way for a few minutes. Uh, so yes, yeah. Our success is defined by you know building a really big, wonderful, engaged audience, and that's how, we, that's how we measure success. And so anyone that's got a good idea is welcome you know, to the table. You know, what you see, look into the crystal ball, look into 2015. Of online news, I assume that everyone on here is, is feeling pretty good about things, I would assume. Mobile, I mean, obviously, that's like no. the most obvious thing I could possibly say right now, but um, mobile. <laughs> but I mean, to mobile, so everyone's always saying mobile is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, but mobile is the, is the majority of our, uh, most of our pages are viewed on mobile. But at some point, don't you think there's going to be that obvious level where it plateaus? Just, I mean, my, 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 you know, other theory is always not to make this about me, obviously, but it's like, if you're at okay. work, you're, <laughs> you're, you're kind of looking on a desktop, usually, if you work like a white collar job in America type of thing. But you're saying, like, well, you don't see Well, gets tone. blocked at lots of points. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's, so that's people have to point. look at all their phones. Yeah. Um, no, you know, I think, I think it's really, I think we, it's actually interesting because the way that our CMS preview is set up is we have a mobile preview that's on the side of the screen where you can see what it looks like as you scroll down the page on your phone. And I think at some point we might just flip them because really, we in BuzzFeed in our offices are looking on computers all the time, but the majority of our users are not. And so really we should be thinking about what mobile users see first, wow. rather than what desktop users see. So, I'm really so. bullish long term on uh, digital media, obviously, like I imagine everyone is here. But I'll just say this, it would not surprise me, like we've had an incredible run in this industry of new launches, of traditional media launching new experiments, um, and it would not surprise me if in the next year or two we saw like retrenchment, some sites that have launched closed down because they're not really viable. Like it's just been an incredible boom. It's awesome. And long term, no question, this is the future. But like I would not surprise me if in the kind of short term, like maybe that faded a little bit and people are like, okay, wait, we got to actually like figure out what works as a business. We can't just keep throwing money at new verticals and new projects and stuff like that. <laughs> I think there's plenty of room for everybody. I mean, I, I've been drinking the delicious Vox Kool-Aid for a long, long time. Um, but but I, I do genuinely feel like there's a lot of stuff that's still left on the table for people to get, whether that's us, whether that's that's these guys, whether it's somebody who hasn't even launched their site yet, I don't know. But I just, every single day, something happens in our editorial team uh, that we realize that we can't do, and I'm not sure anyone can do yet. Um, and that's going to take collaboration between editorial teams and product teams and video teams to go do great things that haven't been done yet, but that, that's still out there to get. Yeah, I think collaborations will be a really important thing today, yesterday, tomorrow, but definitely in 2015. I think that that point that the internet is big enough for all of us um, is one that is easy to say and really hard to do. Because a lot of times the businesses are not necessarily set up to really like foster that collaboration. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities for us to do more together and be able to accomplish more together than we can do on our own. And you know, different publishers are really there's so many fantastic publishers out there who are really really good at sometimes very specific things. And you know, being able to not necessarily put the entire onus on the user to like navigate the web and construct the you know the gestalt of it all on their own, but to say, hey, we're actually going to do some of that hard work for you. We're going to tackle a story. We're going to tackle a subject matter in a way that is going to be able to provide the user a bunch of different angles and kind of do a bit of that hard work for them. Always ramping up. Always, Always ramping up video. Always. Um, 
You know what I'm talking about. Always be <laughs> ramping. That's right. <laughs>
it's, it's only natural if you're going to mention Vox to now go to Chris, who works over at The Verge. And again, The Verge is a property under Vox Media. And The Verge focuses on tech as it is the main vertical for you guys. But not Vox. Yeah. And unfortunately. Um, yes, that, that is different, correct. Uh, so I would actually, I think there are a couple of publications that do an amazing job of instantly capturing the zeitgeist, or that may be, um, which is something that we're always, I think all of us are looking to do, uh, because we're digital native publications. But I would look at these two guys, BuzzFeed and Business Insiders, being great examples of publications where it's like, something, something happens either in the real world or on the internet, and it's instantly there. Um, and that's something that I think that we could be better at. Box.com is really good at it. So yeah, I mean, just something that you admire from another publication. It can be anything. It doesn't have to even be on the editorial side, but obviously it can be. Well, I don't, I, admire may not be the wrong, the right word because okay. it infuriates me, but okay. Business Insider is so fast <laughs> at getting news up right away. Okay. And then filling in the information, like getting up the main news and then filling in with more information. And yeah, that's you know. That's our way of getting. getting Home page. Traffic Great at both. Can you get the news up incredibly fast, but still give this great comprehensive look at things? Is that possible, or are you going to, as a news publication, kind of stir one way more than the other? Depends on how many people you hire. <laughs> uh, that's one part of it. I mean, I think that the other part is, you know, not everyone needs to be great at everything in news. Yeah. The internet is big enough for all of us. So um, I think it's just a question of what you want to be, what you want to stand for, and what you want your audience to come to you for. Uh, if you want to do both, if you can do both, I think that's great. Uh, if you find a way to thread the needle and make both happen on the same article page, then hats off to you. Um, or maybe you can find ways to kind of differentiate you know, the product, differentiate the way that users can interact with what it is that you put out. I mean, just, I mean, in relation to Vice, is it safe to say that you guys are more focused in terms of the immediacy that you're more focused on the actual, you know, overview and the in-depth look at things? Is that, is that a safe thing to say, or? Yeah, I mean, we want people to be able to come to Vice News and get a sense of what is happening in the world. Maybe not the complete view of the world, but a view of the world. Uh, that they can experience along with several others. And yes, we do definitely pride ourselves a bit on slowing the news down. Okay. We, you know, are, we, we lead with our video offering, and it's not short form snackable video. It's often 10, 20, 30, 40, 60 minutes or more. And, you know, the audience stays with us. And so they stay with us because we're telling a good story. And you know, I think that again, in the network news landscape, there's a place for that, and that's something that we find that uh, that we like doing, and that we do well, and that our audience likes. So, um, I mean, let's talk about video just in general for a second. It seems to be a very hot topic that that you'll see out here. Everyone's trying to produce more video, trying to find you know efficient ways to do it. Vice is obviously known for the videos that they've been putting out. You guys have incredible distribution of, of your videos. You know, from the perspective of, of any of the other panelists, and we can obviously go back to you, Mr. Uh, Sterling. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, that that Vice has had the same experience. So it, it's pretty much, for the most part, it sounds like in-house video is what you guys yeah, are really... Yeah, absolutely. What about the, the rest of you guys is that? I, I have really mixed feelings about video, because <laughs> I, I, like, I really like speed, and I love text, and I love reading, and if you can write it in a way that I can... Die. You know, digest it in 10 seconds, then that's fantastic. Um, you know, and the, we've done a lot, gone through a lot of like versions of our video strategy. The one thing that definitely did not work for us early on was basically like what we would call like bad CNBC. So it's like, oh, we're gonna like sit at a desk and interview some guy who's like, you know, whoever it is, some economist or someone, and it's just like no one, like if you wanna watch that, there's two channels, Bloomberg and CNBC, that are really great, and there's no point for us to try recreating that. It's, it's there, it's like, it's all on the web. And then what we've had more success is sort of thinking about videos like, you know, stories that we can tell, guides to various topics that, 
you know, you just couldn't get the same story if you read it. It's not two people sitting at a desk and talking, which is boring. And then that's worked out well. I mean, you know, just my personality, like video, I like, you know, it, it uh, doesn't fit my metabolism typically. But recognizing that video on the web has to be something distinct from what's on TV has definitely been a major plus. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I mean, in three minutes of video, three minutes you can read a lot more than you can glean from video. Um, and I think that, you know, BuzzFeed, the newly minted BuzzFeed motion pictures has kind of understood that to the point where we don't try to just do news video for the sake of doing news video because, you know, just read the story. But with that said, we have been dabbling in news video and it's been really fun to see the people in LA on our BuzzFeed motion pictures side getting involved and, in, you know, doing, they did a video about Ferguson, one of our reporters was there. and. Um, they did a video recently about Ebola, and they're kind of just, they're, they're going to do one of the flu shots soon, and kind of like things that are pegged to the news but are not specifically about a particular news event. What do you, what do you guys see as the biggest challenges with, with video? Because I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a different medium than what you know, most news organizations are, are used to doing historically. So, I mean, what are, what are some big challenges that you've seen? Um, well, I, I just think for us it's been a matter of trusting our video people to know what makes for good video instead of having us say, you guys should do video on this because they know if people are going to watch it or not. Right, that was a big realization for us too um, when we sort of, when we actually decided, you know, dedicated people who are video people and to like make great video content because in the beginning it was like, are you, you know, the markets team or whatever, like, was responsible for coming up with some video ideas, and they didn't know anything about video, and they didn't know what people watched, and that just didn't work at all. So the idea of like actually people who think in video and understand what people want to watch, that's been a significant change for them. So it's fair to say it's really hard to kind of plug people that you know haven't worked in that medium to basically say put out some videos that people are going to. I think it, it, could, it, it could. You know, there are certainly people that can go back and forth. But yeah, just the, you know, I think that really like thinking in video is different than thinking in text. And I Having a distinct team that really like gets that format has been really helpful. Yeah, uh, makes sense. Um, so along the lines of video, I, I want to ask you strongly. I think one thing that's been very impressive about Vice is the number of distribution channels that you guys have really um, been prevalent on. So obviously, there's the relationship you guys have with HBO, and there's also YouTube. And you know, was this like a very formalized strategy that you guys had, and how did this come about? Was this you know, I mean, I'm just trying to get a better feeling as to, I mean, because those are awesome distribution channels, and just how important are those channels versus just people going to news.vice.com to get the videos versus any distribution channel to find Vice videos? We are a digital native, digital first company, but we are agnostic to all screens or any screen. I mean, we just want to make incredible content and put it everywhere. Okay. We want to find a massive audience for our content, and it's a bit selfish to ask everyone to come to your website. <laughs> so, you know, you have to know where your audience is and you have to find ways to get to them. You have to know where the audience you want is and find ways to get to them there. And, you know, I think the key is to also make sure that you're being really thoughtful when you move to a new distribution point. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy in the, in the chase for scale to just want to put everything everywhere. And in doing so, I think that you can devalue the work that you're spending so much time, creative energy, money uh, to put together. And so I think being thoughtful about your distribution and by making sure that when you arrive somewhere, you do so in the best way possible, I think that that does more as, you know, to, to generate momentum. I mean, just, just going along those lines in, in terms of the videos that you guys produce, and you guys have obviously different things, but one thing that I'm curious about is some of the, the, the videos that you guys have put together, I assume that the resources and the, the hours put in are, you know, significant to say the least. I mean, I mean, what are we looking at in terms of, of resources? Like, 
months on end, correct? And with I mean, it depends on the story. I mean, you know, we always take pre-production incredibly seriously. We take all parts of the process incredibly seriously. But, you know, a lot of times, um, until you start doing it, you don't necessarily appreciate how much work you need to put in to get pre-production right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's everything from, you know, making sure that you have, you know, your, your network on the ground, making sure that you've thought through all the different components of it. But then, you know, the fact is, you know, I think it's the Tyson quote, is that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you arrive on the ground, we have a really immersionist style, and it's a very sort of empirical style of storytelling. And so things change, and as long as you're well rehearsed um, and well prepped, then you can adapt, you know, quickly. Um, but in terms of the resources, yeah, I mean, we, we take it incredibly seriously. It's a lot of work. But, you know, we also then find ways to tighten that process up. Something that we never really did until we launched Vice News was a format that we have called Dispatches, where basically we're sending, you know, a shooter, producer, host, and an editor um, in the field. They're shooting. They're running back into the hotel, or maybe there's an editor waiting in the room. They're cutting it, they're prepping it, they're uploading it, they're sending it back, and then we're publishing it the next day. And we've been doing that from Ukraine, from Gaza, from Hong Kong, from Venezuela. We've done that from all around the world just this year, and that's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. I mean, one thing that was pretty interesting that you brought up um, is this aspect of, you know, you're agnostic in terms in regards to devices. As long as people are reading device content, whether, you know, whatever device it may be, whether it's on YouTube or whatnot, you guys are pretty happy about that, it sounds like, which I think that seems to be a new model that publishers have been embracing. But on the flip side, I think it's curious to see that, you know, if you read a lot of the trade, you know, industry articles, they say basically that the home page is dead. You know, what you know, does the home page matter, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm very curious um, to hear all of your thoughts or at least some of your thoughts on the home page and the importance of the home page um, in 2014. Is it still this big thing? Is it less important? Than um, it is not a major driver of traffic mm -hmm. for BuzzFeed. Uh, social obviously is. Um, so. <laughs> so, so, so I mean, what, what about in terms of, I mean, do you look at in terms of the home pages, what you guys represent? Like, if you want to emphasize more of, let's say, your viral content versus BuzzFeed news, do you still look at it that way, or are you kind of like, eh, we'll put... I mean, we try to keep the home page, uh, mm -hmm. at least during the week, um, during business hours on news. Um, on the weekend, we have a different strategy where it's mostly essays and um, sort of lifestyle content, like DIY and, and style. Um, and then, the, obviously, the, the big reported pieces that we like to have hit on Sunday nights. And then, um, and then yeah, so it's, it's mostly news, though. And, you know, our, our home page editor during the day likes to have a little bit of fun with the with the puns. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I think, you know, at Business Insider, it might be a little different because we tend to have, like, probably a slightly older, less, uh, you know, it's like um, our audience is not on social quite as much. Um, but I really liked a couple of years ago when BuzzFeed started the meme that the homepage was dead because I was like, that's great. Everyone's going to take their eye off the ball. <laughs> and we just like, and our homepage has grown a lot in the last three years, and it's grown a lot this year too. So I like very excited about the idea of everyone giving up on You're people welcome. coming to their site. And I mean, I've heard from you guys that your homepage has grown a lot too. So you guys admit that from time to time that it's actually a growing uh, distribution platform. But I was very excited when I heard that because I was like, well, I mean, maybe one day. But part of it is like, you know, all of our sites in the grand scheme of things are small compared to how big the web is. So I feel like you could still have, you know, homepage traffic in general could be a declining thing. But for our, like, you know, young sites, we still have, have a lot of room to uh, grow. And on the point about, like, um, you know, I feel like, you know, it is important, at least for us, to, like, have our homepage be, like, what we consider, like, the truest representation of the brand, the core new stuff that, you know, I like to highlight. 
Yeah, exactly what Joe said. Like the, the, the front page for us, I'm very conflicted on this topic, and we, we, we have very serious meetings about it on, on an almost weekly basis, because the, the front page is uh, the front door and the face of the site. Um, and from, from that perspective, you want it to be beautiful at all times, even though nobody is, is necessarily looking at it. Um, uh, and, and it's for us, it's, uh, there's no doubting the fact that the front page is a decreasing driver of traffic and social is growing by leaps and bounds, uh, and we need to play into that. But I don't think, for you know, it, at the end of the day, you need to have a home somewhere, and it might as well be your front page. That's something that we take very seriously, and we curate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, I mean, in relation to The Verge's homepage, I, I'm sure a number of you read the, the Times Innovation Report, and I think in that, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you could expand on this a bit, Supposedly, you guys redesigned it like 53 times in, what was it, a year? Was, was that the time? Or maybe it was two years? I, I don't remember offhand. I apologize. But it was redesigned like, it seemed like this astronomical amount. Because, you know, a redesign usually is, is a big deal. It takes a lot of time. So The Verge specifically? In the, I, I, yeah, I thought, I, thought, I thought that's what it said, the report. I need to go of, back and, and look at that, uh, yeah. at that report again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we... Um, Chorus, our, our, our CMS uh, tool is, um, I could spend hours talking about that alone, but one of the things that it's very good at is uh, uh, giving us a great deal of flexibility with our homepage, um, not just in terms of what statement, or what stories are placed where, but in terms of what the, the homepage actually looks like. Um, and so there, there might be some confusion on the part of the Times as to what constitutes a, a homepage redesign. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I just noticed the time we have. One other point about, all right, sorry. <laughs> the one other thing I'd like to say about um, the homepage is it's a big, like, you're asking a lot of people to come to, to make visiting your homepage a part of their routine. Like, I, it's, you know, old habits die hard. There are websites I've been going to literally since I was in high school, like the Drudge Report or something like that, that I've just, like, ingrained, like, that's a site that I'll check. But I feel like if you really like focus on that, you think, what's the mix of stories that are here? Like, are we making a really good argument that you should come here? Then even if the homepage doesn't get huge, like you're probably going to do good stuff that benefits you in other ways just by thinking about, are we making a good overall case that a reader should you know, consider us as part of their diet? I kind of want to, it seems like a boring topic, but I mean, even for my own selfish reasons, I have to bring this back up, which is, course as a CMS. You always read about how awesome the CMS is and I think unless you work in the news industry you're kind of like it's a CMS. How awesome can a CMS really be? It's like you know you can hyperlink, you can add images. So can you provide some insight on you know how course is used at Box Media and the Verge specifically? You know you know what is this about that like sure. I always see new things about course. Well I can confirm see. that we can hyperlink and add images. Of <laughs> That's, um, good. That's good to know. Uh, yeah, so we we, uh, we talked a little bit about this before um, before the the panel started. Uh, our our editorial team is is hyper engaged and and interwoven with our product team, uh, and we're talking uh, with them all day long. In fact, a few weeks ago we did something called Verge Hack Week. Maybe some of you saw it, where they just threw code at us and we put it on the site for a week, and it was insane. And half the stories didn't make any sense, but it was okay because it was an experiment. Um, so. The, uh, Really what Chorus is, this is gonna sound super wonky, but it's, it's less of a product and more of an idea. It's, it's the way our organization is, is structured. It's the way we interact with the product team day in and day out. Um, and it is partly about the, the, the tool, obviously. We, we acquired uh, editorially not long ago, uh, and we're gonna do some really amazing things with them. Um, but so if, if you've seen the feature layouts that we have on Vox, uh, or on The Verge, or on SB Nation, or on Polygon, you can get a sense of what the system is capable of. And 95% of what we do there is driven not by custom code created by the product team for that specific article, but by the editors. They, they do it once, they templatize it, and then it's available to the editors, and they just do it on their own, which saves a ton of time, obviously. I mean, how, how long was it in development? Just... Chorus? Yeah. Before my time, <laughs> I showed up. Uh, it wasn't even called Box Media then; it was just at SB Nation in 2011, um, and it wasn't called Chorus then either. It was just a thing, um, and uh, and they had been using it since SB Nation was founded or thereabouts. 
um, and, and it's evolved a lot since then. And of course, all the vertical, well, not all the verticals, the, the Rack Eater Curve organization, which we acquired, uh, is in the process of converting to Chorus. Uh, Eater just went live recently on, on their, their redesign using Chorus. Um, but, but we're getting there. So it's been years to answer your question. It's okay. been, what, seven, eight years, something like that? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I feel as if Vox, Vox and its properties, of course, comes up a lot, less so with pretty much any other publications. But I mean, you know, to, to the rest of you guys, I mean, how important is like the CMS to you guys? Or is it pretty much write good copy, put images in, we're OK? Or you know, does having like the CMS that can do other things and kind of unite different verticals and product and editorial, I mean, do you have strong opinions on that? Um, I, I love our CMS. It's one of the best. I mean, it is the best that I've ever used. It's really, really um, intuitive and easy to use. And you can, you know, we make quizzes. Maybe you've seen them. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. No one's ever heard of a buzz. Yeah. Quiz. Um, and lists, obviously, and uh, polls now. And now we have a new thing where you can re-rank a list that's been ranked. So if, for example, you're a Pisces like me, and you've been ranked as the lowest of all of the signs, then you can rank it to your heart's content. So I don't know, you know, yeah. it's pretty fun. It's <laughs> pretty fun, I love it. Um, we don't actually have too much time, but I mean, I'm definitely interested in the sites as a product. And another thing, not to always go on, like, is it dying or is it alive? But big issue that a lot of publishers have, and some publishers actually have started removing the comments. I, I noticed on all of your sites, it seems to be a big part of um, all of your, all of the sites you guys represent. And I'm just you know, curious to see you know, how important is that commenting in terms of you guys connecting with the com community. I know even some of your sites, like your authors will actually interact a lot with the readers, which seems dangerous. And I've even seen posts where you know, some pretty you know, trolls, essentially, and like even responses to these people. And um, I'd love to just talk about commenting and what it means to, you know, the various publications we have. Uh, well, I personally love comments, actually. Okay. Um, and I think that's because I come out of this kind of old 2005, 2006-ish, 8, 9 blog world where, you know, you would spend hours in the comments of a blog post mm -hmm. of some person who's written something interesting. Um, with that said, comments are, you know, taxing for a lot of people. Um, and abusive, and sometimes difficult to moderate. Um, and it's kind of getting to the point where since you can post, you know, you can see what people think without comments because they're posting on Facebook, they're posting on Twitter, then, you know, comments become less of a community and more of just like a, a pile of garbage. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. Yeah, sometimes comment moderation is, gives you PTSD. But, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think co having comments, having the ability to comment uh, is incredibly important. Yeah. But I also think that that function has been distributed across the social web. And, you know, not everyone wants to be social. Not everyone wants to broadcast their opinion. And I think that, you know, from a user engagement standpoint, we want to welcome everybody into the conversation and you know, create a number of different ways that they can do that. Um, you know, asking someone to broadcast their opinion on Twitter as the only way of engaging in a conversation sounds like a bit of a growth hack, but I don't know if that's necessarily you know, the best thing for all your users. Yeah, yeah I kind of have the same view as Shawnee in that like, I also like was early into blogging and in like early part of the last decade. And in the early days of BI, I was like, yeah, comments, we're never gonna have moderation. We would never <laughs> turn off comments. Like this is like part of the new, it. like this is a defining aspect of the new internet. And now like I don't read comments, I haven't read, clicked on the comments of the posts I've written in like two years. And we have them, we've never really created a comment system that we really feel satisfied with. We've tried different things of like, Moderation and group moderation, and most of the stimulating conversation I get, at least, is like the people I follow on Twitter. And, uh, so it's kind of sad for me because I do have a nostalgia for that time, but it's not the future. I don't think. Great. So we are going to have questions in a minute, but I just want to basically 
you know, get your thoughts on you know, what you see, look into the crystal ball, look into 2015. You know, you, know, you could talk about the, the overall health of online news. I assume that everyone on here is, is feeling pretty good about things, I would assume. But you know, what you see as, let's say, a trend or you know, something that you expect to see in the coming year. So. <laughs> um, mobile, I mean, obviously, that's like no. the most obvious thing I could possibly say right now, but um, mobile. <laughs> but, I mean, to mobile, so everyone's always saying mobile is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, mobile is the, is the majority of our, uh, most of our pages are viewed on mobile. But at some point, don't you think there's going to be that obvious level where it plateaus? Just, I mean, my, 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 you know, other theory is always not to make this about me, obviously, but it's like, if you're at okay. work, you're, <laughs> you're, you're kind of looking on a desktop usually if you work like a white collar job in America type of thing. But you're saying like, well, you don't see a plateau. Well, gets blocked at lots of white collar jobs. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's, that's, so that's people have to look point. at all their phones. Yeah. Um, no, you know, I think, I think it's really, I think we, it's actually interesting because the way that our CMS preview is set up is we have a mobile preview that's on the side of the screen where you can see what it looks like as you scroll down the page on your phone. And I think at some point we might just flip them because really, we in BuzzFeed in our offices are looking on computers all the time, but the majority of our users are not. And so really we should be thinking about what mobile users see first, wow. rather than what desktop users see. That, I mean, that'd be pretty interesting if you made the mobile <laughs> CMS the first. Yeah. The that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, I'm really bullish long term on uh, digital media. Obviously, like I imagine everyone is here. But I'll just say this it would not surprise me. Like, we've had an incredible run in this industry of new launches, of traditional media launching new experiments. Um, and it would not surprise me if in the next year or two we saw like retrenchment, some sites that have launched close down because they're not really viable. Like, it's just been an incredible boom. It's awesome. And long term, no question, this is the future. But like, I would not surprise me if in the kind of short term, like maybe that faded a little bit, and people are like, okay, wait, we got to actually like figure out what works as a business. We can't just keep throwing money at new verticals and new projects and stuff like that. Uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think. I um, think. I think there's plenty of room for everybody. I mean, I, I've been drinking the delicious Vox Kool-Aid for a long, long time. Um, but but I, I do genuinely feel like there's a lot of stuff that's still left on the table for people to get, whether that's us, whether that's that's these guys, whether it's somebody who hasn't even launched their site yet, I don't know. But I just, every single day, something happens in our editorial team uh, that we realize that we can't do, and I'm not sure anyone can do yet. Um, and that's going to take collaboration between editorial teams and product teams and video teams to go do great things that haven't been done yet. But that, that's still out there to get. Yeah, I, that's where my head was going to. I think collaborations will be a really important thing today, yesterday, tomorrow, but definitely in 2015. I think that that point that the internet is big enough for all of us um, is one that is easy to say and really hard to do. Because a lot of times the businesses are not necessarily set up to really like foster that collaboration. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities for us to do more together and be able to accomplish more together than we can do on our own. And you know, different publishers are really there's so many fantastic publishers out there who are really really good at sometimes very specific things. And you know, being able to not necessarily put the entire onus on the user to like navigate the web and construct the you know the gestalt of it all on their own, but to say, hey, we're actually going to do some of that hard work for you. We're going to tackle a story. We're going to tackle a subject matter in a way that is going to be able to provide the user a bunch of different angles and kind of do a bit of that hard work for them. Very interesting. So on that note, we will now take questions for about. 20 minutes. Or do you encourage your content creators or journalists to reach to their audience as well? Mm, that's a very good question. And that's actually something that we just tweaked rather significantly. Um, it used to be that we kind of funneled all of that into one human 
and we realized that that was insane and not uh, scalable. Um, and so uh, what we've also realized is that when you hire a team of extremely self-motivated people, they want to get that engagement, they want to reach out to their audiences, they want to see the, su the successes and the wins on their own reports. Um, and when you turn the keys over to them and let them help promote the stories that they're writing, it makes an enormous difference. And we're, we're I mean, we have metrics, like we know this is working. And that just changed for us. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Most of it, in terms of engagement and growing, is by having a culture of people on editorial that really want to be read and are, get excited that a lot of people uh, see their stuff. One thing I think about, um, you know, in the last several years, is at various times, like, people think there's, like, some trick to growing. So, like, there was a big SEO fad, and everyone thought you could, like, search engine your way to the top. Then in the last couple of years, everyone's like, oh, social. And, or, you know, we're going to, like, turn some key and explode on social. When really, like, those don't work. The only thing that works is, like, trying really hard to do great stories that people like. And then, of course, you know, understanding a few techniques can help. Um, so, you know, really the core is just keep doing stuff that we think our audience really likes. And all the stuff about engagement and growing our audience, like, mostly takes care of itself. Um, yeah, I agree, Joe. I, I feel like Wesley doesn't, we have um, many different audiences. And part of that is because of the way that um, we grew initially, which is a, around identity content, which was before BuzzFeed even had a news division. Um, and so, you know, we, I think we encourage our writers, particularly those who are doing entertainment content, to think about um, not going for a middle ground where you're making a joke and explaining it. You're just making the joke. And like, you're making it to a specific group of people and hopefully like, if it's like things all Persian kids understand, like then all Persian <laughs> kids will love that post, and everybody else will be like, "Huh?" And that's exactly how it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a good point that you can kind of infuse the content itself, a bit of the audience development at, at the core. But um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think that you know it's basically all of the above. You have to do everything. You have to know the tricks and the levers that you can pull. But, you know, then you got to do the daily grind, and it's hard, hard work, and that's everything from editorial selection to the way you package your content to the way and the places that you distribute. Frequency and the timing, and you can timing, and you can drown in data, you can drown in data, but ultimately you have to ultimately make content for the content. Hey, I'm Nikki Usher. I'm a professor at George Washington. Um, and my question for you is, if there was one thing that would really distinguish you for the future? Like just one thing you had to say that was like your hallmark to fame, what would it be? Video. <laughs> quizzes? <laughs> um, yeah, quizzes. Quizzes? <laughs> uh, I like that we have a business audience. I feel like it helps us a little bit uh, differentiate. Uh, mystique. Um, I, w I was I was joking earlier with some folks that uh, uh, what is the bird has become like a running joke of a question that uh, people ask us and, and we ask ourselves on an ongoing basis. I think that uh, not necessarily having 100% of that answer actually works for our, our advantage. So my question is more content or sorry oriented so when digital spiked everyone thought that a lot of the institutional publications you know would either close and obviously there's a huge shift that's taking place in format but I'm wondering from each of you as far as content and news goes if there are still avenues or just uh, if there's more if there's ways that you'd like to be pushing the envelope or things you'd like to be covering more than you are now or you know, if there's more gaps that you see to be filled as far as content and what kinds of things are getting covered by the media. Oh, a absolutely. I mean, I think that the day that our pitches and the, the kinds of stories that we want to cover outnumber our r reporters is a very sad day indeed. Uh, or, wait, the other way around. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> take that back. Uh, no, it's, it, we, we always are lamenting uh, limited staff, and I think that that's a good place to be. You want to just be bursting at the seams with ideas. Um, and so the, the short answer to your question for us is, is 
yes, there's lots of additional uh, stories we could be covering and entire uh, kinds and categories of content that we, we could be covering. Can you say what some of those are? Sorry, I meant to ask that. Um, I'll give you a really simple example, and maybe this is a little too simple, but uh, it comes immediately to mind because I'm very heavily engaged with it right now. Automotive. Um, we are trying to break into that space, uh, and we, we don't have the staff for it, we don't have the writers for it, but we're trying. Um, and and uh, you, you can see how the Verge uh, ethos can apply to many categories of, of coverage that we just aren't even remotely in right now. So that's where we are. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree completely. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we obviously, we are, I mean, for example, we're looking to build out a San Francisco BRL, um, kind of focusing on the business of tech. Um, and then I also think it'll have some of the fun stuff there too. So that's like one area where we really want to hit hard and we've kind of half-assed it till now. But um, And then, you know, but then you get to the point of diminishing returns, like should we open a Jackson Hole Bureau? Sure, I'd love to, but you know, probably not a lot of views there. Oh, I'm sorry, where, where are you guys located right now? Like where are your, your offices outside of New York, obviously? Um, we have, a, our major bureaus are in DC, LA, and London. Um, but we're also in Australia. Uh, uh, <laughs> we just opened BuzzFeed Germany and Brazil. And yeah. that's it for now. Right. Oi. Um, there are any number of things that we want to cover, that we plan to cover, and that we will cover. Um, you know, again, the internet is big enough for everybody. And, you know, there, there's always room for another point of view. The question is whether that's going to be welcome or not, but that's to be determined by the audience. But you know, if you have a good point of view, then it, it could be worth sharing on any given topic. Um, for Vice News, you know, we've been ramping up our political coverage. Um, we've we've been um, investing heavily there. Um, Environmental coverage is incredibly important to us. It's, it's core to the company as a whole, and we're making more serious strides there. But we're going to be moving into no, 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 treading on your ground necessarily. But we're going to be doing some business coverage. <laughs> I've read Shane Smith saying they would never cover monetary policy. <laughs> well, listen, we do a little bit of economic analysis, a little bit of crystal ball reading, but we're not reporting you know, the words of the Fed oracles. So uh, okay. that's all you. Uh, um, we'll be moving into any number of different categories. And, uh, you know, really, it'll be a bit of, I mean, it's the internet, so you can also test. You can try things, and you can see what works. And if it works, then you do more of it. And if it doesn't work, you either change it or you stop it. So we'll kind of keep, you know, testing and learning. Uh, I think you were next, correct, I believe. My question is, what do you think about brand as publishers? What are some strengths, weaknesses, and what are some missing ingredients that they cannot seem to mature, or whatever perspective you guys have on brand as publishers? Again, the internet is big enough for everybody. And you know, uh, everyone that has a voice, or everything that has a voice, um, has an opportunity to articulate that, right? To publish editorial through socials to make video to do whatever they want and you know I mean I think that it creates an opportunity for uh, brands through publishing to actually add value right to to the entertainment and media landscape um, if they're looking to be purely extractive maybe that'll work if that's what they want if it's just like hey buy this thing do this thing you know whatever um, but if they want to add to the conversation, I mean, the fact that those tools are now completely free and open is, I think, a good thing overall. Uh, I agree with that, I think. I mean, I, I have the luxury of not really having to think about brands as publishers. In my role, we, we keep a pretty, like we have a literal wall between business and editorial, but you know, um, I think there's room for anybody to add value, and when you make a dumb joke on Twitter, people will say you made a dumb joke on Twitter, whether you're a person or a brand. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, people, there's always this concern that's like, oh, brand publishing is like deceptive or trying to fool people. I think that you know, people underestimate readers. They usually tell what's going on. Um, and, you know, I think there are certainly times when like brands can create, you know, good content. I see like lists on BuzzFeed from brands that are like r really good. Like they're really, uh, they're entertaining content. Um, so I, I don't see anything wrong. Uh, yeah, echoing what, what Shani said, we have an enormous wall, a physical brick wall. No, uh, we have a wall that separates editorial from uh, from our um, Fox Creative and, and business operations. So that's uh, you know your, your question. Um, in in some ways, I'm, I don't think I'm able to effectively answer uh, just because I, I try not to think about that stuff to some degree. Uh, but I do follow Denny's Diner, so uh, and it's one of the best things on the internet. So uh, brands and publishers, thumbs up. I appreciate how bullish you guys have been about digital media and the, the appetite for video out there. And I think a lot of people think that video is what's going to save us and take us, um, you know, fill in where ads left off. Sterling said a couple of times, the internet is big enough for us, for us all, but is it big enough for us all to monetize in a sustainable way? Or is video a house of cards that's going to lead to Joe's giant 2015 retrenchment? I, I really do try very hard not to think about it in my role. Um, it's that's for our business operation to figure out. I hope they do. I think that I think they're doing it. Um, but uh, but I can tell you that uh, there's enough clapping and laughter coming from that side of our office that I suspect that there are still many wins to be had. And and I can tell you that um, that uh, our advertisers are extremely their their appetite their appetite for video is as voracious as our readers' appetite for for video, as far as I can tell. So that's encouraging. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any insight on that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I, I, I'm just here to write content and edit things. I don't yeah. know. I, if it's going to happen, it's not going to be for several years to come. Um, you know, there, there are two sides to it, right? What is the, one is the audience side and one is the sort of revenue side. On the audience side, video consumption is skyrocketing. Um, you know, Digital video consumption continues to increase year over year over year over year with no signs of really slowing down. So there's definitely the appetite for that. And as long as you make great video content and find an effective way to distribute it, the, there will be an audience. And then just on the you know paying for it side, there are any number of different ways to pay for, for video. Um, from just a purely like advertising you know, media standpoint, the largest shift in advertising dollars in the history of advertising is going to be the shift in dollars from TV to digital, right? And there are reasons that that hasn't happened as fast as it could, but it will happen. And so, again, we're not nearly anywhere near capacity on what the video landscape, you know, the, nothing is, is peaking anytime soon. Sounds good. The first one, I'm going to try and extrapolate. I'm going to pull it in as I'm asking you from, uh, from Robin, uh, our friend at CrowdTangle. Um, so I'm going I'm to try and read her mind a little here. Can we can we talk about startups? I, I think maybe <laughs> one way we could expand on this. So not not startups maybe as competitors, but for us it, it's data visual. You know that's that's the startup in our incubator. They're doing some great stuff for us and for other people to supplement their coverage. So maybe not competitors so much, but are there startups out there that you're working with or they catch your eye? They're doing some great things that are uh, are really building on the work that. Not only your four organizations, but others are doing as well. Now, maybe 10 second answer.
So I just pulled it up. I'll, I'll paraphrase. Uh, thoughts on data journalism and where it fits in the future? Uh, quick lightning answers. It's, it's huge. I mean, the, I mean, the opportunities are, are endless. And it's, like a, it's, a, it's a very, very big area of focus for us and I think for many of our competitors in the, in the industry and figuring out ways not just to ingest data but to make it engaging for readers. Those are both enormous challenges that we've only scratched the surface on solving. That's the impression I get. Yeah, I mean, everyone, what's not to love about data? Like, I love charts, and I feel like there's, you know, an expectation. I mean, what's, what's the, you know, yeah, data's great. Uh, I am also in favor of data. Um, I don't know, it's, it's great. Uh, it's a tool, like reporting, or going to a courthouse, or I don't know, any number of things that journalists use to provide information. It can be wrong, it can be right, it's great. It's not the future savior or anything. Yeah, it's, it's not a new place to look for a story. There are just new uh, tools for looking at different sets of data. So, you know, it's, data is wonderful, data is great. <laughs> so on that note, we have some closing remarks from Sina, and then after this, we can all grab a drink and continue the conversation outside. And thanks for braving this dark and stormy night and coming out and joining us. Appreciate it, and I hope you'll stick around. We went on a beer run during this, uh, this little interlude, so there's more beer, food, and um, I hope to meet a lot of you during the networking part of this. Thanks again.